We're continuing to monitor the results of the American elections. Joined now by Voice of America correspondent Anita Powell and also the CEO of GeoQuant, an adjunct professor at Columbia University, Mark Rosenberg. Anita, I'm going to start with you. Good afternoon to you again. Um, we've seen the U.S. president speaking now. He's just tweeted as well. Yes, he's just put out a tweet after about eight hours of silence. Um, I'm going to read it for you. Do I have to use Donald Trump's voice? Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> Last night I was leading, often solidly, in many key states, in almost all instances Democrat-run and controlled. Then, one by one, they started to magically disappear as surprise ballot dumps were counted. Very strange, and the pollsters got it completely and historically wrong. Which so is, you know, It's a continuation of his theme that this election is going to be stolen from him. He's digging in, um, and some of the comments that you're seeing on social media are really worrying. Uh, supporters of Donald Trump are saying things like, send in the army and sort this out, which is, um, you know, not something that a lot of Americans want to see. In a way, it also it raises the tension. He is the incumbent, so he speaks at the podium of the White House. He raises the tension. He changes the entire tone. It also forces a situation in which the Biden campaign is forced to respond. I wonder if they will to this. Mm. I mean, this is, this is dangerous territory, really, isn't it? I mean, he's, he's alleging that there's fraud. He's alleging that there's fraud. He hasn't given evidence. No, he hasn't given any evidence, but that's what he's saying, basically. This is dangerous territory. I think the Biden campaign is probably looking at this in maybe not surprise, maybe not shock. But, you know, I don't know if they're going to engage with this. They probably also have gamed it out. Mm -hmm. Professor Mark Rosenberg, you're joining us now. And I mean, you've been looking at what's been playing out in the United States all the way through today, but long before that. In fact, you suggested, uh, if I've understood your piece correctly, you suggested there are parallels between the sort of governance of Donald Trump and, in fact, what happened in South Africa during the dying days of apartheid. Yeah, I think the underlying commonality is um, really the, the end of uh, minority rule, in both cases, white. Christian minority rule or white minority rule in the case of South Africa due to demographic change and due to um, uh, institutional um, change or pressure for institutional change to lessen the impact of minority rule. In South Africa, of course, the majority minority rule was much more severe. The countries are very different in many other ways, particularly economically. But the underlying dynamic of political institutions under pressure uh, due to demographic change is very similar. And you see that in our current election results where Joe Biden is, uh, you know, commandingly leading in the popular vote, um, collecting far more votes on a national level than Donald Trump. And yet we're in a situation where the election is a nail biter, where the president is alleging fraud um, because of the institutions that are set up. Uh, in order to maintain effectively minority rule. And, and, and that's the similarity to South Africa. We've also seen, and I mean, you know, we remember the protests in South Africa, the anti-apartheid protests. We can go, you know, all the way back to Sharpville through the 1976 Soweto riots. I mean, the Black Lives Matter protests certainly have some sort of resonance. And so, I must say, does the response by often white police officers? Yes, exactly. That, 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 that uh, likewise is a similarity. Um, in that um, the, uh, you know, the response of the security forces, domestic security forces, um, to this um, internal challenge, right, have been very concerning. I think what, what uh, uh, my colleague uh, who spoke earlier um, said is, is exactly right in that what we're now seeing here in the United States are, are levels of political uncertainty and potential political violence which are unheard of for this kind of developed market, right, a, a large established democracy with deep uh, economic power and financial markets. This is the kind of thing that uh, in my former career um, as an Africa analyst, I would um, often advise clients and write papers on uh, with regard to sub-Saharan Africa or other emerging markets, uh, but U.S. politics are now um, uh, quite similar to that. I mean, and to extend the metaphor a little further, you tell me when I sort of cross the line, but there's also yeah. an appeal to a kind of nationalism that people who are against me are undermining our entire nation. I mean, again, the similarity between P.W. Buerta, his wagging of the finger, and Donald Trump's wagging of the finger this morning. Exactly. I think there, there's two very different national narratives in the United States. You see that in the deep polarization of our electorate. You see that in the election results. Um, and that, that likewise is quite similar. There was obviously two very different ideas of what it meant to be South African um, in uh, late, um, the late apartheid, early democ democratic stage. There was the, the rainbow nation, um, which eventually prevailed, um, at least uh, politically. And then there was the white 
um, Afrikaner or at least white nationalist nation. Um, and those two things uh, were in conflict, and that drove a lot of the political and social uncertainty in South Africa. In, in similar ways, that's what's happening in the United States. There's so much to talk about there. I mean, Anita, in a way, I would almost suggest, and I mean, you're, you're from Texas, I'm not, that the way that it feels to be an American might have changed quite significantly over the last decade. Oh, I think that's, that's uh, definitely true. Um, I just want to alert you, by the way, to some news that's just come over the transom, which is that Kanye West has conceded after <laughs> <laughs> failing to get 0.5% of the vote in any state. Um, it's just so comforting in this, in this weird interregnum to be able to call a result definitively. And so I think uh, we should probably bring it to the people of South Africa first. Kanye West is not going to be the next president. Professor Rosenberg, I mean, one of the conversations that we have to have is if you have there's huge divisions in the United States and there are important reasons we've been discussing them through the afternoon as to why that's happened. Is it possible for someone, you know, all the king's horses and all the king's men to put the United States back together again? Uh, I think so uh, in that um, there is, um, well, it's, it's a difficult question. Um, I think, um, let me say that, that the tail risk of, um, of a kind of permanent fracture or some kind of civil unrest or civil war in the United States is pretty fat, meaning in kind of statistical terms, it's unlikely to happen, but, but it's, it's, it's too likely than, than comfort. It's a kind of what we call a fat tail risk in, in, in economics. Uh, I think though that um, largely speaking, still the institutional and economic structure of the, company, or of the country will keep it together and that the collective incentives of the political actors is ultimately to maintain the union, ultimately to not cause too much economic instability, not to cause too much market volatility. I think the fact that Joe Biden is a moderate and a, and a, um, a longtime senator who has worked with Republicans probably is a positive in, in, in this instance, assuming he holds on. Um, I think if, uh, if Donald Trump ends up winning, um, we're going to have a much more difficult time, um, uh, you know, put, putting the country uh, on a more unified path. Um, I mean, talking of economics, I mean, economics is key to all of this, as it usually is in democracies. If we hadn't seen people in America feeling, and I think to some extent with, with justification, that they were living lives that were poorer than their parents, if they weren't feeling that inequality in the United States had grown in the way in which it has, we might not be in this situation. I think just like the underlying ethno-religious demographic changes that we spoke about, about white minority rule driving, or the end of white minority rule driving this instability, likewise, the, the socioeconomic change that you mentioned, um, the, the, la the, the decrease in kind of class mobility in the United States, the increased financialization of the economy versus um, uh, the real economy, um, growing inequality, all of that, I think, has, has um, deepened the cleavage, um, and, and I, so I, I absolutely agree. Anita Powell, I mean, one of the things that this means is that you've got different groups of people who live in the same areas but don't necessarily talk to each other, or they might go to the same children's parties, their children might go to the same school, but they just don't discuss it. Uh, actually, I think it's more that many Americans, and maybe Professor Rosenberg will agree with me, are living in echo chambers, are living in these, like, silos socially. Um, if you were to look at one American's Facebook page, for example, you might see a completely different tone on somebody else's Facebook page than you might be seeing on mine or somebody else in my circle. Um, I think that Americans are kind of self-selecting, and it's um, partly to do with, uh, I don't know, the legacy of urban planning in the U.S., the legacy of segregation in the U.S., that we have physically actually put people into, into weird little enclaves. Um, and I think that's what's happening in the U.S. Um, I don't think that there's as much political diversity in these enclaves as we think. I think there are just a lot of enclaves. Hmm. I mean, Professor Rosenberg, it's such an interesting point, and I mean, social media is key to all of this. I'm fascinated by, by the idea, if, I mean, if Trump wins, I would suggest that one of the words that might describe the next four years in the United States in American politics would be the word bitter. In other words, everyone's going to be angry at each other. And, and he increasingly might also, even though he might still be in power, be bitter. And the people who voted against him would certainly be bitter. I think that's right. I, frankly, I think that that is probably true in the near to medium term in the, in the United States, uh, regardless of who wins. 
I think, um, as we discussed earlier, uh, you know, the chances for that um, sentiment and that kind of national mood to persist um, is higher if, if Trump ends up winning, um, as opposed to Biden, who just is a more conciliatory kind of politician. Uh, but yes, I think um, I think Americans are at odds with each, with each other politically at this point in a, a historic way, um, and that's showing in the results and that's showing in in, in the uncertainty around them. Um, you know, there was also, a, a, and I mean, in South Africa's case, and you made the point earlier about the sort of commonalities, the resonances with what happened in South Africa. There was a way out, and the way out was to basically end apartheid, and that's what happened. Um, Nelson Mandela was released, and we, we all remember that time from there. I don't know what the way out is for the United States in this case. I mean, it's not quite the same situation, of course. It's not nearly as bad. But I don't know what the way out for the U.S. is. There probably would be, a co again, another commonality in that the, the way out or the solution would involve institutional change. Right? In South Africa, that was fundamentally fundamental institutional change, really regime change from... Um, you know, a, a, a white minority rule institutionalized in the apartheid regime to a, um, a multi-party, multi-ethnic democracy. The United States, um, the institutional change would probably need to be less severe, but um, still um, significant nonetheless. Changes to the Electoral College, potentially changes to um, the, um, the representation or, or the, the number of seats in the Senate. Again, these are all things that um, in the given the current results will be quite difficult uh, for a, a Biden administration to, to do, given that the Republicans are gonna control, uh, looks like the Congress, um, and that his uh, mandate will be relatively narrow. Um, and so um, I think the, the, you know, the, the prospects for institutional change to try to alleviate some of this pressure in the United States um, are, is unlikely um, you know, in, the, in the medium term, but ultimately, there are mechanisms for, um, for changing the way the game is played um, in a way that, that could be more stable down the line. I mean, Anita Powell, I mean, this is an interesting point. Institutional change, you're looking at a system that's been going since the late, what, 1780s it is. Um, that's a long time. A lot of, a lot of sort of, uh, what's the word, momentum builds up in a particular way, but a lot of inertia builds up too. Yeah, I think the key here is that the institutional change needs to follow the current social change. It's not like things need to change. Things have changed in the United States. We have six states that are now majority minority. We have, um, we have no official language. We have hundreds of languages spoken in the U.S. on any given day. We have a society that has changed faster than the institutions have been able to keep up with. And I think that is, um, I mean, you can see this very clearly between the Trump camp and the Biden camp, that Trump wants to maintain the older style institutions that may not reflect the current social and political reality of the lives of ordinary Americans. And Biden seems more willing to move with the times. But um, yeah, I think, I think we just need to catch up to the social change that has happened. Hmm. Professor Rosenberg, I mean, final vote to you in this conversation. Are you prepared to actually make any predictions or are you going to use the old-fashioned phrase, it's too close to call? Oh, no, that, that's what I do for a living. So, um, <laughs> you know, our data continues to, to show that, that, that there will be a turnover of power in the United States and that uh, Joe Biden will win uh, the election. Um, the data also continues to show that we're entering a period of, of unique political um, and social instability in the United States. Our indicators are all hitting a peak as we head into the end of the year. And so, um, you know, both of those things are, are outputs of our model and, and, and look like they are bearing out um, uh, in the macro sense, unfortunately, in terms of the, the instability and the uh, potential social um, implications thereof. I think if everybody watching this and everyone I've spoken to today to play in one band, you'd call the band Hedging Your Bets. Professor Mark Rosenberg, thanks very much indeed. Really appreciate the time. CEO of GeoQuant and Junk Professor at Columbia University, Anita Powell from Voice of America. Thank you very much indeed.